So the next talk uh, is by uh, Andre Duarte. Um, he'll be presenting the paper, Implementing Superposition in uh, iPreverd uh, System Description. Um, hello, uh, thank you for being here. Um, so in this short talk, I will try to summarize some of the novel features in the superposition calculus uh, in iProver. So first, quickly an introduction to iProver. Uh, iProver is an automated theorem prover for first order logic, and it's mainly based on <clears throat> an instantiation calculus called instgen. However, um, it, uh, it has a modular architecture that supports running multiple calculi um, in a schedule, for example. It is repetitionally complete for first order logic and it also decides certain important fragments of EPR, um, of, of first order logic such as EPR. Um, so the main motivation to implement a separate calculus, in this case a proposition um, in iProver, is that there is no single calculus that is optimal for all conceivable problems. So some problems are solved very easily by some techniques and not at all by others. So yes, so, so, so it's important to have uh, several different strategies. Also, there is the issue that uh, performance in a saturation prover degrades very fast as time goes on. Uh, more and more, <clears throat> as more and more clauses are stored in the indices and the main operations on those data structures get slower and slower, the, the clause processing rate uh, drops um, dramatically. So yes, as you can see, most of the problems that are solved are actually solved very quickly or not at all. And also particularly in iProver, uh, due to its modular architecture, clauses can be shared between calculi for simplification. For example, um, superposition may be good at deriving certain lemmas, which are then passed to instantiation and used to simplify clauses there. Um, as a corollary, um, it's basically better to run many strategies for a short time each than actually running one strategy for a very long time. <clears throat> Okay, so this is a summary of the superposition calculus, uh, which is refut refutationally complete set of inferences for first order logic with equality. So I won't get into the details. And also there, these are some of the simplifying inferences that iProver also uses. So the previous inferences were required for completeness. Uh, these are not, but they are essential for actual practical performance since they allow us to delete redundant clauses. Um, either by identifying tautologies, for example, or by detecting that a clause is a special case of another clause that's already present, that's a uh, subsumption rule, etc. Um, in particular, you may notice that um, two of these are actually restricted cases of... of, of so subset subsumption is a restricted case of, of subsumption and it may seem a bit odd that we have both there but we will see how they can be um, useful uh, later on. So subset subsumption is weaker but the advantage is also that it's substantially faster to check since false subsumption requires us to to check instantiation and subset subsumption is just checking that a clause is a sub multiset of another clause. Um, uh, in that vein, um, regarding demodulation, um, we can also conceive of a weaker ver variant that doesn't check instantiation. Um, we call it light normalization. So light normalization is the simplification rule, simply that given an orientable unit equation, if we find the left-hand side on a clause, except uh, at this corner case here, um, we can replace it by the right hand side. So this can be implemented with a simple hash table plus uh, an index of subterms, um, which gives us very fast uh, lookups to simplify new clauses. Uh, so when we derive a new equation, first we reduce it with respect to the equations already kept, then we use it to reduce the equations that are already kept, and finally we just add uh, a binding from, from left-hand side to right-hand side in the hash table. 
<clears throat> when we want to simplify a clause, we simply traverse the term bottom up and look it up in the hash table. And yes, well, actually, it's even better than this, since to be precise, the rule should look more something like this. Where actually, when we were rewriting a subterm, we're not just rewriting with respect to one equation, but to all of the equations in one step. So, yeah, so, so with the cost of um, k hash table lookups, where k is the number of subterms in the clause, we can normalize a clause with respect to r, independently of how many clauses already are uh, already exist in r. <clears throat> so to summarize, compared to full demodulation, like normalization is of course weaker, but it enables us to much more quickly um, find the rewrites for all of the clauses, and also this 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 complexity remains the same no matter independently of the of the number of clauses that that are in the light normalization set. Um, <clears throat> moving on again, still with with simplifications, there's lots of freedom in choosing how to exactly do these simplifications, and there's also the issue that these simplifications require certain data structures and certain indices to implement efficiently. And some indices even support multiple simpli uh, simplification rules. For example, the subsumption index enables subsumption and uh, subsumption resolution. So all of this is quite non-trivial non to choose how to do, uh, how, how, what's the best, the best way to do this. Well, um, well, a typical given clause loop looks like this. So the clauses start in, in, in the passive set. Then one given clause at a time it's, is activated. All of the inferences between the given and active set are performed. And the new clauses are put back into passive until either a contradiction is found or the passive is empty, meaning that the set is saturated. Um, so this is the, the basic form of a given clause loop, which is also what's implemented in, 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 in iProver. Um, so in general, the passive set is much larger than the active set, <clears throat> which means that operations on clauses in the passive sets are slow and on the active set are much faster. Um, so keeping this in mind, we, we, yeah, we will have to keep this in mind for our, when we decide how we want to do simplifications. <clears throat> so a naive architecture for simplifications is the so-called uh, otter loop, where we simply um, simplify all newly derived clauses with respect to every previously kept clause forwards and backwards. So it was quickly realized that in most runs this meant spending the vast majority of time simplifying clauses in the passive that may not even end up being used ever. So yeah, so after some time the prover spends almost in, all of the runtime just doing these simplifications that that will be useless. So discount it chose to simplify only with respect to the active set. So the the new clauses and the given clause are simplified, but only with the active set. The passive set remains um, truly truly passive and not participating in simplification inferences. So the advantage, of course, is that simplifications are done much more quickly, but the disadvantage, of course, is that passive clauses are not participating in such simplifications. And, for example, a useful lemma may sit for a very long time in passive, not being used, um, when in fact a, a simple demodulation or something could unlock the proof in a fraction of a second, but it ends up not happening um, because the, those, those simplifications are not performed. Uh, yeah, so you, so you can you can sort of see the, the the balance that's involved here and how it's very non-obvious what's the the best strategy <clears throat> to choose. Well, for example, we may try a sort of compromise. Clauses in passive can simplify only forwards, for example. Um, so we we simplify new clauses with passive, but not vice versa. While with active, yeah, we simplify in both directions, both forwards and backwards. Um, this is maybe useful because, um, because also because the, the the not only because a passive set is much larger, but also 
uh, simplifying equations in active is much more valuable because if you remove something from active, it's less less generating inferences being done and less new clauses being generated. Um, or we could make use of the, the, the sort of pairs of simplifications that we mentioned before and use the cheap ones with passive, like subsets assumption and light normalization, but use the full, more expensive simplifications um, with with the active. <clears throat> also, we can make the following observations. Um, in each given clause loop iteration, the clauses that are derived are often closely related or even repeated. So, also while the passive set grows very large, the set of new clauses in each loop stays comparatively small. And finally, we also make the observation that since those clauses are related, it, it may happen that one of the children uh, deletes, um, makes makes its parent redundant. Um, for example, if if some newly derived clause subsumes its uh, the the given clause, the inference is done with it. All of the inferences done with it are redundant, so we can throw away all of those newly derived clauses in in this iteration, uh, except for the one that just subsumed it. Um, this can be thought of as a restricted version. Of, of, of orphan elimination. So our hypothesis is basically that it may be useful that the set of newly derived clauses together with the given clause, um, that, that, that we keep it intersimplified with some rules. Um, yeah, so the full picture of the approver simplification loop will look something like this, where each of those error, arrows represents um, uh, a, a path in which we can apply simplifications uh, and we can choose which ones to apply in each of those paths uh, independently. Um, so this is uh, this is highly configurable by command line options and also Hypro iProver has built in many heuristics to try to pick a good choice of, uh, of simplification setup <clears throat> for um, depending on the problem type uh, etc. Uh, finally, another issue that I'd like to discuss, if I still have time, is associativity and commutativity. So a symbol is AC if these axioms hold for it, for the associativity and commutativity. Um, AC is notoriously, notoriously difficult to handle in, in calcula like superposition, which rely on a, on a reduction order. And as it happens, they are also used pervasively in, in nearly every domain. So techniques to handle this are, are very important. Well, during preprocessing, uh, we have the, we, we can do whatever transformation we want as long as it preserves satisfiability. So we normalize AC terms by making them right associative and sorted with respect to some, to some order. In our case, uh, a total extension of the, of the reduction order using, using, used for superposition. Uh, however, during saturation, we are restricted by the completeness of the underlying calculus. So we're not free to make uh, any sort of uh, transformations that we want. <clears throat> we can still make terms right associative, except for one small corner case. And we also can stable, stably sort um, with respect to, to KBO, which is the reduction order we are using in superposition. Uh, where stable just means that we don't swap any subterms which are um, incomparable. Okay, f furthermore, um, we also have a criterion where if some terms L and R are equal modulo AC and L equals R is neither an instance of one of those three equations or an or can it be simplified via them, where that's the that, that simplified it's, is the transformations that we discussed on the previous slide. Uh, then if that happens, we can simplify clauses containing uh, L equals R or L not equals R. These tests are very cheap to apply in practice, checking if two terms are equal modulo AC. And this enables us to, to delete many redundant clauses, um, as well as avoid generating inferences between the axioms themselves, which is also very, very important. Um, because without this criterion, they would um, they would 
they would, we would make inferences with between the axioms and this will lead to combinatorial explosion. Uh, finally, there's the issue of detecting that the symbol is AC. Uh, well, a symbol is AC if the input problem implies the AC axioms for that symbol. So usually we just check if the axioms are present in the input problem, but of course this is uh, sort of um, a very crude approximation of entailment. So of course this, the symbol may be associative and commutative without the standard axioms actually being uh, present in the input. And it's also very important that we <clears throat> that we detect the AC symbols as soon as possible, uh, so we can initiate um, AC reasoning early. So we attempt to do this by, first of all, simply detecting if AC axioms ever show up during normal saturation, but also specifically checking entailment of these axioms before we start saturation during preprocessing um, by checking. Um, the, the, if, if the axioms are implied using some fast approximation for, for any um, candidate symbols that are uh, binary and correctly typed and that, that, that could be uh, candidates for AC, for AC symbols. <clears throat> okay, so that's a um, quick summary and um, thank you for listening. Great, uh, thanks for the talk. Uh... Are there any questions? So yeah, just a quick question. So the the um, the superposition techniques here uh, do they combine with Instgen in any meaningful way in iProver? Uh, well, we can first we can run them in a schedule, which um, means that they will put together they will solve more problems than just running sure. only instantiation or only superposition. Um, but also they, they they can share clauses for for simplification, so clauses okay. in in superposition can be used to simplify clauses in instantiation and vice versa, so they they, they can communicate the, the the loops can communicate between themselves. I see. Any uh, further questions? All right. So let's thank the speaker.